Well, good morning, First Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here and joining us, whether that's online or in person. My name is Doug. I'm one of the lay pastors here, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you. If you are a guest here today or online, we would encourage you to let us know a little bit more about yourself. We currently here physically don't have a welcome center, so if you want to know more about us, feel free to track me down after the service or this guy here. His name's Kevin. He would help you also. And if you're online, there's a connect card that you can also click on and fill out, and that will help you know a little bit more about us. This morning, our service, we're going to be singing some songs and praises to God, and then Kevin will be bringing his, uh, the message from God's Word later following. A couple of things to bring to your announcement, or to your attention, please. Just um, First of all, this Tuesday, we're going to have Giving Tuesday, so you'll probably get a reminder online for that. Uh, this is for us as a church family uh, to give back to our church a Christmas gift, so we would encourage you to think about that above and beyond your regular giving. What we're trying to raise this year is a new camera for streaming services online. Uh, the current camera we're using is a borrowed camera. Uh, the Houstons have generously let us use it, but we really want to get it back into their possession, and so we're looking to get our own camera for that. There's also a giving tree over in the south wing here as you exit. Take an opportunity to look at that. If you feel led, please take one of the cards and follow the instructions. These are gifts that are then going to be used at Food Bank to bless some of the families who come. Uh, where are we at? We have a business and budget meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. Please make sure you note that it's 6 o'clock. And that if you were the person who announced it last year is 6 o'clock and showed up at 7 o'clock and happens to be the same person this year, you will note that it's at 6 o'clock. But I say that because every other evening service we ever have here starts at 7. But for some reason, the budget meeting's at 6. So I guess that's so that we can, you know, still go for four hours. No. Um, so tonight, there'll also be a Zoom link if you want to connect online. Check out our First Beers website, our Facebook page, and there'll be a link on there. And our very own John the Man will be manning that during the service. Ba -dum -boom -tsh. Next week, December 6th at 2.30, we're having a First Steps course. If you are interested in knowing more about us, please sign up for that. Let the church office know. Um, but I think you could even come if you didn't sign up. Next Sunday is communion, the first Sunday of the month, so we would encourage you to bring uh, communion, some bread, and some juice with you, and we're also starting a new series next week on the book of Luke called King for All. At this time, I just want to bring, remind you about the public health uh, recommendations and guidance. First of all, we need to be thankful that we are able to meet. And we will be praying later for some churches in southern Ontario where they're no longer able to meet. Current uh, guidelines are that masks are supposed to be worn in indoor public gatherings at all times to protect yourself and those around you. Try and keep two meters from those outside your household. Sanitize your hands regularly. And the current recommendations or guidelines uh, tell us that singing is strongly discouraged. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we read, as a measure to get us ready for worship, Psalm 145. So we're going to begin at the very top there where it says a song of praise. And we're going to read through uh, the first 13 verses together. A song of praise of David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, 
slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Let's praise him together. Kevin. Amen. What a great reminder of how great our God is, the one who made everything and the one who loves us and sent his son Jesus to die for us. We're going to be singing a song called Open Up the Heavens, and it just uh, it starts out this way. We've waited for this day to gather in your name, and our hope and, and prayer is that that's true of you. As you think about gathering together as the body of Jesus, that uh, you did that in anticipation this week, and you're looking forward this morning to what God's going to do in our midst. And so let's uh, open up the heavens. You're welcome to clap if you like, raise your hands, worship. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we look into the sky. You're standing like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seeing. Show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord.
Well, this next song is called Rescuer. It's uh, one of our favorites around here. It just uh, speaks the gospel so clear and true that Jesus has taken us from people who are dead in our sins and trespasses and brought us to life in Christ. He is our rescuer. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There's good news for the captain, good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walks away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how Sweet the sound, hey. oh how grace hey. abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He's beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor, he's friendship for the one the world ignores. He's pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how peace abounds. Well, our rescuer. So come and be fearless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary. There is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary. So come and be chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calvary. There is redemption for every affliction, we at the foot of Calvary. He's our rescuer. Give him praise with our hands right now, church. Amen. Well, this next song is called Blessed Assurance. And uh, as we think about how much God has blessed us with, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we can know that he never lets go. We can know for sure that we have salvation in through Jesus. Be 
shaken, I will not be moved. Oh, blessed assurance. No other love that I've ever known compares to Ever our anchor. seated. A couple of things I forgot to mention. First of all, believe it or not, today is the first Sunday of Advent. So if you follow the Advent tradition, I did note you version. If you have that Bible on your, the U Bible or U version Bible on your phone or device or computer, they have many options for doing some Advent readings as we anticipate and look forward to celebrating Christ's birth and what it means to us as believers um, for us as far as the hope that is found in Christ. Another thing I also forgot to mention is with the bathrooms over there to my far right, your left, once you have used it, please make sure that you wipe it down so that others uh, are safe to use it. This time would be our time to normally take up offering. So if you're online, there should be an option there for you to click and to donate online. And people here, you're free to do that as well. But if you want to do that physically, there is a box at the back. Please make sure you use that as you leave today. Our missionaries for this week are Chris and Karen Ball. Just a couple things to tell you about them. They were rejoicing this week and uh, that their schools have reopened. And so the kids are back into more of a regular routine. Uh, Chris, this not this week, the week before, had to fly to Kenya. And the trip there and back required not one, not two, 
but three COVID tests. So he's an expert on getting COVID tests done, and thankfully those were all negative. And if you saw on Facebook, he was up and flying again this week, so life is somewhat back to normal for them. Uh, please be praying for them. Karen is teaching t uh, in the school there and also in the public school. And they're just looking for opportunities with a boys' orphanage nearby um, for them to become involved with. A couple other things to be praying for. We heard today that John Fournier is back in Timmins now and apparently is tuning in online. So good to see you, I guess, John. Uh, John had a heart attack a couple weeks ago, was down in Sudbury, successfully had a stent put in, and he is back now recuperating. So please be praying for John and Jeanette. Uh, Doug Chichu, uh, he's had a recent loss in the last little while of his brother, uh, his dad, and also a close family friend. So please be praying for Doug. Uh, let's be praying for our business meeting tonight. And I mentioned churches that are closing in southern Ontario. Uh, I have a friend, or our church used to support this fellow. His name's Daryl Dash. He's doing a church plant in Liberty Village. And last Sunday I saw he posted on Sunday that they had to close their doors, and that was the last Sunday that they'll be meeting for at least four weeks. So let's be remembering our brothers and sisters uh, meeting in those gray and red zones within Ontario and other places like Manitoba where they're not permitted to meet due to the concerns with the pandemic. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful that you are a great and mighty God. Your word tells us that you have established your throne in the heavens and that your kingdom rules over all. We've just been singing, Father, of the, your, of the assurance that we have of the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. And Lord, when the world around us seems to be confusing and causing challenges, whether that's personally between physical health or mental health, of our social economic status, relationships, whatever it is, no matter what is thrown at us, all the difficulties that we face. Father, we have an assurance that our hope is founded in you. And that though these times that are difficult, they are temporary. And we look forward to the time when we will be with you in glory. And so, Father, we pray that our focus would be on you during these difficult times. Father, we are thankful for those who continue to support the work here financially and for how you have provided for this church to continue to um, speak the good news of Jesus Christ and to be a light, not only in our community, but around the world. Father, we pray for Chris and Karen and their children, Will, Addie, and Kate, as they are serving in South Sudan, an area that is anything but safe. Father, may they have safety, especially for Chris as he flies, but also may they have opportunity to be a witness even within their town of Juba that they live in. Father, we praise you that John Fournier is doing better and is back home. We thank you for the doctors and nurses who took care of him. And we just pray for him as he recovers, Father, that he would regain good health and that he would continue to find his hope and his um, assurance in what is found that is eternal. Father, for Doug Chichu, we pray that you would comfort him in the loss of family members and close friends. Father, may his faith be stronger and may he be, rely on you during this difficult time. We pray for unity tonight at our business meeting as we meet and set the budget. Father, you know how finances have an ability to drive wedges and divisions within churches and people. And so we would ask that none of that would occur tonight, but that we would be a church united in our mission and in our focus on, produce, on um, announcing the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. And Father, I pray for those churches in southern Ontario that are not able to meet at this time. Think specifically of Liberty Village and Daryl Dash as he tries with his uh, group of people to launch a church. What a difficult time launching a church in their area in downtown Toronto has got to be hard at the best of times, let alone 
with the pandemic situation. And so I pray that you would encourage him today, that he would remain faithful, and that their, their church, uh, even though challenged, would grow and continue, uh, that others would see who you are through their witness. Father, we give you thanks. You are a great and mighty God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Doug. And uh, at this time, we're going to be welcoming a new family into our church membership. And so if you are interested in being a member, that's what First Steps course is all about. That's how you learn what we're about and, and uh, how to become a member. Um, but we figured, you know, it was about time that we um, let Pastor John be a member. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, you know, because of the, the pandemic and things, it uh, got a little bit delayed, but uh, we th figured yeah, just before the business meeting and the budget meeting, we should probably let this happen. And uh, so you've, you've heard uh, Pastor John's uh, testimony, of course, and you know how the Lord has worked in his and Alex's life to bring them here to minister in Timmins. And uh, I mean, if you don't know more details about that story, you should uh, talk to John and Alex and just how God worked and, and all that it is so amazing to hear. Uh, and so... Uh, when you do become a, a member here, basically you're saying, hey, I am committed to being a part of this family. Uh, and so you're committed to being present on, on uh, Sunday mornings as you're enabled to, to do so, be part of a community groups. You're committed to using the gifts that God has given you to serve and build up his church, and, and you're committed to support the place financially uh, as God has blessed you. And uh, so that's a little bit of a nutshell of what it means to become a member. But essentially you're saying, hey, uh, I identify with these people. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I want to journey with them together. And so um, I want to invite Alex and John to stand along with their um, children. That's Gabriel and Micah. And um, we're going to ask uh, our leaders who are on our oversight team, our deacons and our over, uh, pastors as well to stand. So you have an idea who they are. And um, this is our way of COVID welcoming them. They're going to give them the long distance high five uh, welcome. And uh, the rest of us are just going to welcome them with a round of applause. So welcome, guys. Thank you so much for being a part of our church family. Well, this next song that we're going to sing, uh, you should know it. It's called How Great Thou Art. It's a wonderful song of just speaking of the greatness of God in his life. And so I want to, if you're able to stand, uh, I invite you to do that. And also if you're able to clap, if you can keep a beat, this is a song to keep a beat too. All right. Uh, as we sing together, especially on the chorus, as we sing, how great thou art. <laughs>
said amen indeed let's continue to worship the king oh worship the king all glorious above oh gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, the buried in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of his might, oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is alive and cannot be slain. His is the wrath of the thunder God's form, and God is his path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless King, to you alone be our majesty. Your glories and wonders, what's on every side, we breathe in the air. To worship above thy mercies, how tender, how good to be at our nature, defender, redeemer, and man. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? You bring. Please open your Bibles or turn them on, and Sam, come read the Word. Good morning, church. My name is Sam, and today we'll be reading in Genesis chapter 48, its entirety. So please turn with me or turn on your Bibles to Genesis 48. One day, not long after this, word came to Joseph. Your father is failing rapidly. So Joseph went to visit his father, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Joseph arrived, Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to see you. 
So Jacob gathered his strength and sat up in his bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations and I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. <clears throat> now I am claiming as my own sons these two boys of yours, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born here in the land of Egypt before I arrived. They will be my sons, just as Reuben and Simeon are. But any children born to you in the future will be your own, and they will inherit land within the territories of their brothers, Ephraim and Manasseh. Long ago, as I was returning from Padan Aram, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. We were still on the way, some distance from Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So with great sorrow, I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. Then Jacob looked over at the two boys. Are these your sons? He asked. Yes, Joseph told him. These are the sons God has given me here in Egypt. And Jacob said, bring them closer to me so I can bless them. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him and Jacob kissed and embraced them. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I would see your face again, but now God has let me see your children too. Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob with his right hand, he directed Ephraim towards Jacob's left hand, and with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay his hands on the boys. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, though he was the younger boy, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my grandfather Abraham and my father Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life, to you this very day. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May he preserve my name and the names of Abraham and Isaac, and may their descendants multiply greatly throughout the earth. But Joseph was upset when he saw that his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. So Joseph lift, lifted it to move it to Ephraim's head, from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. No, my father, he said, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. I know, my son, I know, he replied. Manasseh will also become a great people, but his younger brother will become even greater, and his descendants will become a multitude of nations. So Jacob blessed the boys that day, with this blessing, the people of Israel will use your names when they give a blessing. They will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manasseh. In this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Jacob said to Joseph, look, I am about to die, but God, but God will be with you and will take you back to Canaan, the land of your, the land of your ancestors. And beyond what I have given you, your brothers, I am giving you an extra portion of land that I took from the Amorites with my sword and bow. Well, thank you, Sam. Appreciate that. So good morning again, church. Um, I have to laugh a little bit at my friend, Doug. Um, I don't know if you caught this or not. Uh, and, and Doug, when you're talking about Daryl Dash and Liberty Church Village, I'm not sure whether you're trying to convince yourself or others, but you said, I have a friend. And you stopped. And so I want to let you know that you have more than a friend, my friends. All right. So uh, it's good. We're good. <laughs> uh, and then guys at the back, uh, just a couple of notes, Justin and, and uh, Pierre and stuff. Uh, make sure you have that video uh, queued up and good to go. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, we're in uh, the end of the book of Genesis. We're finishing off the plot twist this morning. And uh, we've been learning and watching and going through the life of Joseph, right? Seeing all the ups and downs and the, the turnarounds that, that God has brought him through. And I hope that by the end of this series, you will have remembered, known, take with you that God is in control. No matter what the circumstance, good, bad, or ugly, God is in control. He has us. He loves us. And he's walking with us 
through the deepest valley and the highest mountain that we experience. And as we end off today, we're going to be talking uh, about the blessing of God on our life. And so uh, I can't cover three chapters in one message. You wouldn't want me to. We'd be here for a really long time. And uh, so we're going to focus on the blessings where Joseph sorry, is blessed by his father and then where the rest of the boys get blessed as well. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that in, in chapter 49. But here's the focal point of this morning. How often do we end up focusing on the blessings that God gives us and we miss out on the God behind the blessings? That's regular, I think, that we're so thankful and should, we should be for the blessings that we have been given by God. But the point of the blessing is not just, hey, thank you, God, for the blessing. It's to get us to focus on the God behind the blessings so that we would get him to get to know him more, that we would trust him more, that our walk with him would grow deeper as we get to know him more. So that's where we're going this morning when it comes to blessing. And so little audience participation this morning. How many of you by raise of hands would love to always be blessed, right? I think all of us would be, yeah, absolutely, right? We're up there. I mean, I would love to have a blessing tree in the backyard, wouldn't you? Where you just go out when the time is right, pick the blessing, all right, and, and away we go. Of course, we would all love for that to happen. But we know that's not how real life works, right? Uh, and God himself is not some genie to bottle that we just rub the right way or pray the right prayers, and we go ka and down comes the blessings, Many people think that's how God works, but he doesn't operate that way. But we need to be, remember at the same time that God loves to bless his children. All right? A um, couple of uh, things to, to back that up, right? We are a blessed people, and God loves to bless his children. There's no question about this. So a couple of verses here. Uh, there we go. All right. <laughs> So this is what it says in Jeremiah 17, 7, 8. It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of joy. Wouldn't that be great to, if you, that could be said of you? As you have gotten to know the Lord, you're like that tree who is blessed by the Lord. And no matter what season it is, whether it's rainy season or drought season, you can say, hey, I am blessed. And then over in Matthew chapter 7, it uh, says this. Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him? So Christmas is coming. As parents, right, we love to give gifts to our kids, right? Just that their faces on Christmas morning. Just boo, right? I mean, we love that. And Jesus says, how much more than that feeling that you have does God have when he gives us good gifts? He loves to give, gifts, give good gifts to his children. But sometimes, and I'm just saying this of me, I'm sure this is not true of you, but sometimes you, we say to the Lord, hey, God, like more blessing, please. Like I need some more. I want more. All right. And we act like the spoiled rotten kid on Christmas morning when they say, that's it. Right? I mean, where's the thing I asked for? The PS5. Come on. Parents, you're so terrible. All right? So sometimes we act like that when it comes to God, and we shouldn't. And so, again, this morning the focus is not just the blessing. We're thankful for the blessings, but we want to focus on the God behind the blessing. And so as we've gone through this series, we've been learning Genesis 50 verse 20, which is our theme verse. I would love to be able to say this. Actually, maybe I can say it. Um, I got this really good deal on chocolate bars for uh, the youth group, 25 cent chocolate bars at No Frills. It was amazing. I was really blown away by this. But the reason I say that is because if you can come afterwards and say this verse by memory, I will give you a chocolate bar. All right? You will be extra blessed if you can say this by memory. All right, let's say it together, uh, starting with as. Here we go. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. All right, so the offer's on the table, chocolate bar for you to be had, okay? Here we go. So we've been going through this series in, in Joseph, and we've been learning these things. We've been learning how to fight temptation. We've been learning what it means to fear God. We've been learning how God provides in tough times. We've been learning to forgive. We've been 
uh, learning what it means to being used by God for good. We've been, last week we talked about the promises of God, that we can count on them. And we took a look at the misery of sin and the holiness of God. And as we've already said, and it's just say it again to help us remember, that God is in control of every situation. We can trust him no matter what we're going through. And as we end off this series, we're looking at this laundry list of blessings. So how do we apply this to ourselves? Well, here it is. Here's the big idea for this morning. It is this. God's blessings lead me to the God of blessing. God's blessings lead me to the God of blessing. Don't just leave it at the blessing, but take a look at the very character of the giver, the God behind the blessing. Well, it's really easy for us to lose sight of God in the middle of all the good times, right? Um, how, oft, how much more do we cry out to God in the bad times than the good times, right? It's easy for, to forget God when everything is going hunky-dory. As a matter of fact, uh, God actually warned his people going into the promised land. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so we've got uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. Gen uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, verses 10 to 12. God says this to his people, warning them, because he knows good times are about to come. He knows everybody is going to be at peace. And when everyone's at peace and everything's going smoothly, that's the times when we tend to forget the God behind the blessings. We focus just on the blessings. He says this, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your forefathers, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, with houses full of every good thing with which you did not fill them, with wells that you did not dig, with vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and you're satisfied, be careful not to forget the Lord. How easy is it for us to do the same thing? When everything's going great at home, right? When our job is flowing smoothly, we just put our feet up and we focus just on the blessings and we forget the God behind the blessings. So let's take a look at this God behind the blessings. Who is he? And, and Jacob, in his blessing of his sons, really enlightens us into who is the God behind the blessings. And he is this, first and foremost, the God of blessing is God Almighty. The God of blessing is God Almighty. And in verses 3 and 4 of our text today, which is Genesis 48, we see Jacob saying this. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make you a company of peoples. And I will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. So what does it mean, God Almighty? What does that mean? Well, the Hebrew is this, it's El Shaddai. Uh, and you, you might have sung a song back in the day about that if uh, you've been in church for any length of time. What does El Shaddai mean? El Shaddai means this, the most powerful one or the all sufficient one. So he's the God who's able to overpower, which means he has absolute power. Absolute. There's no one who can compare to him. There's no one who can stand in the ring when it comes to God and hold their own. No one. He is absolutely in a category all to himself. You might have heard the phrase that goes something like this uh, by Lord Acton. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We leave it there, though, and then he finishes off with this. Great men are almost always bad men. See, this doesn't apply to God when it comes to absolute power. Because why? Because God's other characteristics, like his holiness and his justice, balance his power out. God is perfectly powerful and perfectly holy and perfectly good. And yet we, when we get into that position, things tend to go south really quickly uh, when it comes to absolute power. We can see that in our world today. And so it is God who nourishes. It's God who protects. It's God who supplies every single one of our needs. Why? Because he's the El Shaddai. He's the almighty God, the most powerful one. And so I want you to consider this for a second. What enables God to bless is because he is God almighty. Let me say that again. What enables God to bless us is because he is God Almighty. It is God as El Shaddai, the Almighty One, who sustains, who abundantly blesses with all manner of blessings. So think this through with me, if you will, for a second. If God was not all sufficient, then he could not bless us, his children, could he? With whatever he blesses with, all the things he blesses with us. 
So if he wasn't all sufficient, if he wasn't the most powerful one, he couldn't bless us like he does. He would be limited, but he's not limited because he's God Almighty, the most powerful one, right? So it is this God, the Almighty God, who, remember in Genesis earlier, he speaks and what happens? Stuff creates out of nothing. This is the Almighty God that we serve. He is the one who conquers sin and death when Christ came and he died on the cross bearing all of our sin and the wrath of God and then he was killed and then he defeated the grave. This is the Almighty One, the God who is Almighty, the El Shaddai. He is the one who saves us from our sin and from hell itself, our deserved fates. Yet because of Christ, we put our faith in him, the Almighty One saves us. There's a quote by the guy by the name of Nathan Stone. You probably never heard of him, and I had neither, but I like his quote. He says, only an all-powerful one could be all-sufficient and all-bountiful. He is almighty because he's able to carry out his purposes and plans to their fullest and most glorious and triumphant completion. Again, take a look at your Bibles over in Genesis 59, 49, I'm sorry, 49. There is no Genesis 59. In Genesis 49, verse 25, Jacob says this, he says, by the God of your father who will help you, by the almighty, catch it, the almighty, the El Shaddai, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. God as the almighty, his character then flow, outflow blessings because he is the almighty one. And then, again, if you want to flip back in your Bibles, you can to Genesis 28, verse 3, where Jacob is blessed. This is at the Jacob's ladder time, right? We've got God Almighty. He says this, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. And so as we think about God being the all-sufficient one, here's the contrast. God is all-sufficient. We are insufficient, Right? I want you to say that with me for a second. I am insufficient. I know that might take a lot for you to say that. You might have to humble yourself and swallow some pie there, but you can do it. Ready? Here we go on the count of three. I'm sufficient. One, two, three. I'm insufficient. I should say, not sufficient. You know what I meant, right? I am insufficient. And we, as insufficient people, come before a God who's all sufficient, trusting in Him alone to save us, trusting in Him alone to provide for us. And so, Tomorrow, when you wake up and go to work, remember, that's not you. That's God working in you. You are insufficient, but God Almighty is allowing you to go to, to work and, and make the income that you make and et cetera, et cetera. Provide for the family that you need to provide for. And so, a little homework for you. I want to encourage you this week, when you think about all the blessings that God has given you, count your many blessings Name them one by one. As you do that, and I encourage you to do that, like get out a piece of paper with your family and write the blessings that God has given you. Don't focus solely on the blessings. Remember, El Shaddai, God Almighty, the all-sufficient one is providing those things for you. Second thing this text helps us understand is this, is that the God of blessing actually walks with us. Verse 15 of Genesis 48. When Jacob is blessing Joseph, he says this, and he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. And we'll get to the shepherd in a second, but I want to focus on the God of blessing who walks with us. The one who walked with Abraham and Isaac, what Jacob is saying is, now Joseph, this God walks with you. It's the same God who walks with whom? Us. The God who walks with us in our highs and our lows, our ups and our downs, our plot twists of life, this same God is walking with us. And so Jacob uh, was in a covenant relationship with God, right? So we looked at that a little bit last week in Genesis 28, where that covenant happened, where God promised, I will make you into a great nation, and I will be, what is it, church? I will be with you, right? That same promise is with us, right? Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, right? This is the promise of God. He's one who walks with his people. And then this reminds us also of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So 
Uh, you can do this homework on your own. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is when God makes this covenant promise with Abraham. But let me summarize it for you. See if you can recognize the familiarity of it. Where God says this to Abraham, Jacob's granddad. I will make you into a great nation. Does that sound familiar? I will bless you and make your name great. Does that sound familiar? Why? So that you will be a blessing. And you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. And so you've heard me say this before, and I will say it again. The reason why God has blessed you is not so that you can hoard all the blessings. It's why. So that you can. Oh, boy. I've not done a very good job of teaching you, church, apparently. All right? So we are blessed to be a blessing, right? We're blessed so that we can bless other people. That's why God has given us the many blessings that he has. And so he blesses us. And so God goes through life with us. He walks with us through the ups and downs of life. He leads us in the plot twists of life. And I don't know about you, but as I reflect on, on my life and the ups and downs of my life, the beauty of having a relationship with God is that when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, who's leading you? God is. He's right there with his staff, protecting you, guarding you, walking you through that valley. He is right there. And so we walk hand in hand with the God who made everything. Don't forget that. We walk life hand in hand with the God who's in control of everything. Don't forget that. We walk life hand in hand with the God who knows the future. Don't forget that. We walk life hand in hand with the God who goes with us in the good times, bad times, mountaintops and the valleys. Don't forget that. He is with you. And so I encourage you as you think about that this week, the God who walks with you, instead of you leading him, how about you let God lead you this week? All right, third thing. We've already mentioned it, but what a great image of who God is, right? The God of blessing is our who? Our shepherd. And so in verse 15, we see that again, right? Jacob blesses his son as he says this about God. The God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. And we've touched on this a little bit in this series, but as we, again, we take a look at the, the roller coaster ride of Jacob's life, right? When, um, he, well, just think about it. He had to work seven years for a wife and then his father-in-law deceived him. And on his wedding night, he discovered, oh, I married the wrong woman. Oh boy. All right. Well, then he decided to work another seven years and got a second wife and not recommending that by any stretch of the imagination. Don't do that. All right. But he did it. And, uh, and then he had his son, Joseph, right? I mean, he was deceived and he thought he lost his son. Only we discovered that he didn't. And God had been looking after and planning all these things along. And so as Joseph took a look back at his life, he said, hey, you know what? God has been my shepherd the entire time, walking me through life. And he's now saying this to his son, Joseph. Joseph, as God has been my shepherd, may he be yours. May he guide you in life as you walk with him. And then if you flash forward to Genesis 49, verse 24, we see the same image come in where J uh, Jacob says to his son Joseph, God is the shepherd. He is the stone of Israel. And I don't know about you, but as I think about God as shepherd, where does your mind go? To a certain psalm, perhaps? Anybody know where it is? Psalm 23. It's up on the screen. Look at that right there. There it is. Good, good, good eyesight there, Andrew. And where, where we see this, right? The Lord is my Shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for he is with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. And so my encouragement to you is remember that God is your good shepherd, which means he, his job as a shepherd is to actually lead you to the blessings of life. Things like food and shelter and still waters. Right, but also leads you through the tough times of life. That's what a shepherd does. He defends like, the sheep against the wolves and the lions who want to eat them. Right? This is who our God is. And then that also flashes us forward to John chapter 10, where Jesus says this, helping us see the connection between the Yahweh of the Old Testament and him as God in flesh. He says, I am the good shepherd. What does the good shepherd do? He lays down his life for the sheep. 
And that is a reference to the cross when Christ died for us, his sheep, so that we can have life forever. So if you've not yet put your faith in the good shepherd, I mean, now is the time to do it. He is the one who provides every and all blessings that you experience in life now. I mean, just take a breath for a second. Breathe in. The reason why you can breathe in is because God is blessing you with the ability for your lungs to work. Providing you the air for that to work. That's how deep this blessing goes. And God, as the shepherd, is the one who leads, guides, and protects us. And so there's a, a song that we're going to introduce to you at some point. Uh, it's by a, a band called the City of Light. City of Light. Not of light. The City of Light. And it goes like this. For the Lord, my shepherd, leads me. And I think I spelled leads wrong. I did. He leads me, and he is all I need. In the darkest valley, I know, I know my shepherd is all I need. Why don't you say that with me? Here we go. For the Lord, my shepherd, leads me, and he is all I need. In the darkest valley, I know, I know, my shepherd is all I need. Can you say that this morning? My shepherd is all I need. Well, final thing I want us to focus on, the God behind the blessing, is the God of blessing redeems me from evil. In verse 16, we see Jacob saying this, The angel of the Lord, the angel who has redeemed me, I'm sorry, from all evil, bless the boys. Well, maybe you're asking yourself this question. Well, why does Jacob refer to God as an angel? Hmm, good question. Well, let me refer you to the Bible Project video that you're going to watch right now, which hopefully will answer that question. ordinary sometimes can we uh, restart that guys please heaven right here in our so in the bible reality is made up of two overlapping realms the heavens and the earth our space and god's space and while life here on earth may seem ordinary sometimes we can encounter heaven right here in our own realm yes this happens a number of times in the bible and when it does we often encounter a fascinating character the angel of yahweh or in most translations of the bible the angel of the lord now we've talked about angels. They're spiritual messengers who perform missions for God. But the angel of the Lord is no mere angel. How so? Well, every time he appears, he's described in a way that's purposefully puzzling. And it leaves you wondering, was that an angel sent by Yahweh? Or was that Yahweh himself? What do you mean? Here's one of many examples. In the book of Genesis, there's a story about Hagar, Abraham and Sarah's runaway Egyptian slave. And we read this. The angel of Yahweh called to Hagar. But then this angel speaks as if he is Yahweh, saying, I will give you many descendants. And then Hagar responds and says, you are God who sees me. So the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh. But that can't be. In the Bible, you can't see Yahweh or you'll die. Yeah. So this story and others like it are inviting us into a paradox that Yahweh is above all, inaccessible to us. But sometimes he reveals himself to us in ways that we can see and understand. And that's where this character shows up. He's Yahweh made visible to us. Yes, distinct from Yahweh and also Yahweh. This is very similar to other biblical stories about prophets who get a glimpse into God's space, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. And what they see is a glorious human figure on a throne who's called Yahweh. So the one on the throne and the angel of Yahweh, this is the same person. Exactly. Watch all this come together in the famous story of Moses and the burning bush, where we read, The angel of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And when Yahweh saw that Moses stopped to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So this person in the bush is called the angel of Yahweh, then Yahweh, and then God. And then later in the story, Moses learns that the figure in the burning bush is the one leading Israel out of Egypt in a pillar of fire and cloud. And that's the one who later takes up residence in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, this is the throne room of God himself. You got it. The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of Yahweh appearing as a human. Now, keep all this in mind as we start talking about Jesus. In the opening of the Gospel of John, we're told that from all eternity, Jesus was with God and was God. Distinct from God and also God. That's the same paradox we saw with the angel of Yahweh. Right. And then John says that God's word became human and set up a tabernacle among us. The temple presence of the invisible God. Exactly. Now check this out. 
There's a story about when Jesus took three of his followers up to a mountain and his true identity was revealed. He was transformed into a glorious human figure. Okay, I see what's going on here. So the angel of the Lord was God appearing like a human and Jesus is God now become a human. Yes. And notice this, in the New Testament, no one ever uses the phrase angel of the Lord to describe Jesus. Why not? Well, they wanted to avoid the idea that Jesus was merely an angel. For them, Jesus was Yahweh God become human in order to fulfill his ultimate mission to fully reunite heaven and earth once and for all. Well, hopefully that uh, makes some sense to you as you think about who the angel of the Lord is. It is Christ himself, right? Making a pre-incarnate appearance in the Old Testament, and we see Jesus appearing at the God-man, of course, at Christmas time. All right, well, what is this angel doing? The angel of the Lord is redeeming, right? The angel of the Lord is redeeming, which means this. Redeem is the word rescue, to bail someone out of debt or slavery or to avenge a death in the case of a murderer. And so we see this as Jesus being Jacob's redeemer. Jesus is being Jacob's redeemer. And so what happened in Jacob's story? Why did he need to be rescued? Well, Jacob was actually, remember between Esau and, and Jacob, remember things weren't going well? And, and Jacob had to flee for his life from his brother uh, because he stole the blessing. And so Jacob is fleeing from his brother, and he fled into the clutches of his uncle who deceived him, and Jacob had no one to rescue him. And so God himself stepped in and rescued Jacob. And we see that happening in the story of Genesis uh, 32 and 33. So there's a little homework assignment for you. You can read that this afternoon. But basically what Jacob is saying is, God is my rescuer. We know that the one who rescued him was in fact Christ. Guess who rescues us? Jesus does. Does Christ does. And so Jesus is our redeemer. And he can be our redeemer. Why do we need to be rescued? Why do we need to be saved? You and I, born into sin. Our default setting is hell. That's what scripture teaches us. The only way to change that is to be rescued by Christ. The one who's the way, the truth, and the life. The only one. There's no other option, all right? You cannot be good enough. You can't come to church enough. You can't be religious enough. It is Christ and him alone who redeems us from hell and the grave. So where's your faith this morning? Are you trying to redeem yourself? Because I can tell you, fall flat on your face. You're going to fail big time if you try to redeem yourself. You can only trust in the one who is the perfect God man, the one who can redeem us. And so Jesus redeems us, but he also avenges us. He's our avenger of our death because you and I are spiritually dead. We're dead. That's what scripture teaches us. And the only way to be made alive is through Christ. And so he quickens our souls. He makes them alive again so that we can have life. And the beautiful thing about this is this, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this church, but when we put our faith in Jesus, do you know when you have eternal life? Exactly. Like the moment you trust Jesus, you have eternal life. So right now, if you're trusting Christ, you have eternal life. It is as guaranteed as the breath you just breathed, right? I mean, it's guaranteed for sure, for real, for eternity. Guaranteed. You have it right now. And so as you think about being redeemed and having that eternal life right now, what scripture challenges us with this is since you are redeemed, then live as though you are redeemed. That's what challenges us with. Uh, John 17, verse 3, helps us understand that. This is a verse I had on my wall growing up, and love it. It says this, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have said. Sent, I'm sorry. And then this is uh, D.A. Carson. Some of you might know him, a good a deep theologian. He's Canadian as well, by the way. It says this, he says this, eternal life hinges on nothing more and nothing less than knowing God. And so as we think about that, I want to ask you this question. Do you know God? Not do you know about him? Not have you read about him? 
Do you know him? In this thing called your heart, your soul, do you know him? Do you have a personal relationship with him through Jesus? Because if you don't, you can't have eternal life. But if you do, you have it secured forever. You have been redeemed. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says this, as we think about living this out. Paul says this, you're not your own. You were what? Bought or redeemed with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so as we think about, hey, God's my redeemer. That's who he is. How do we live this out? I live like I am redeemed. I should be living like I am redeemed. And so a couple things I think to keep in mind. When we live like we're redeemed, how should we act? Well, we don't eat and eat and eat and make our stomachs our God, do we? We trust Jesus to be our God. We don't sin sexually and make sex our God. We make God our God. We don't harm each other physically and make might our God. We don't love money and hoard everything, making money our God. We live as though we are redeemed because God is our God. Almighty El Shaddai God is our God. And so we honor God as we live this out. Being redeemed, we honor God with our bodies. These things that God has blessed us with, our bodies. And so we actively kill sin in our lives, right? How many times have you gotten that knife out? Metaphorically speaking, just to be clear here, all right? And you've killed that sin in your life only for it to rise up again, all right? We keep killing it. We keep killing it. Romans 8, 12, and 13 says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death of deeds of the body, you will live. And so we regularly get out that knife, again, metaphorically, and we are stabbing that sin that keeps rising up against us. And we kill it with the help of Jesus because he's the one who has redeemed our bodies. And so as we wrap this up, thinking through, hey, how do we go out from here and live knowing that God is our El Shaddai, knowing that he is the one who walks with us, knowing the one that he has redeemed us and knowing that he is our shepherd we strive with the help of the Lord to live as though these things are true. And so my prayer for me and my prayer for you as we end off and close off today is that you will live as though the El Shaddai provides for you. You will, you will live as though the shepherd is guiding you and leading you and you will live as though Christ has redeemed you. So as we end off, don't lose sight of the blesser behind the blessings. We're entering into the season of blessing, if you will, right? Where we give gifts to each other. We bless one another and don't just make it about the gifts, but make it about the giver too, right? Make it about the giver more than the gift. And so next week, as we get ourselves into the Christmas season, we're entering in a new series and we're going to be in the book of Luke looking at how Christ is king for all. And the focus of the book of Luke is exactly that, that Jesus is the king for the debtor and the poor man, just as he is king for the most excellent Theophilus that he addresses right in the first couple of verses. And Christ is king and can be king for you if you'll submit your life to him. So let's stand up. We're going to uh, receive the blessing of the Lord as we leave. And just a couple of reminders as we leave uh, remember, you're leaving out this door over here and you're making your way down the stairs and out through the uh, door by the bathrooms, trying to keep yourself socially distanced. You're welcome to hang around for a few minutes and, and chat as we end off. And um, yeah, I think that about sums it up. And so let me pray the Lord's blessing over you as we leave. Let's pray together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, God bless you. Don't lose sight of the blesser, though, behind the blessing. If you have any questions about this morning, whether it's online or whether it's in-house, we'll take those in just a minute or so.